Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Eric Davidson, President of the American Geophysical Union. At last year's fall meeting, shortly after the 2016 U.S. elections, we organized a special session, a special plenary session that we called the Shifting Landscape to begin a discussion on what the new political landscape would mean for AGU, our members, and the scientific community. In that discussion, and many more since that time, AGU has reaffirmed our commitment to continue to defend and advance scientific integrity in the coming years, and to seek bipartisan and nonpartisan partnership to support evidence-based policy deliberations. That said, we have been frustrated and alarmed during the last year by many of the actions taken by the current administration. Key science positions are still vacant. Proposed budgets undercut federal support for investment in science. Scientists have been blocked from presenting their research or serving on advisory panels. And policy decisions have been made that run counter to scientific evidence and that fail to acknowledge the value of independent, peer-reviewed scientific input to policy deliberations. Among the most troubling of these concerns was the administration's announcement in June that the U.S. will pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. With Syria having since joined the agreement, that now leaves the U.S. as the only country not committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to stabilize the global climate. The We Are Still In movement and other related international efforts respond to that decision, showing that despite the actions of the U.S. federal government, supporters from city, state, and local governments, universities, and the private sector stand ready to join their international partners in maintaining a strong commitment to the accord. AGU is doing its part in numerous ways including the renovation of our headquarters building in Washington, D.C. to be a cutting-edge demonstration of net zero energy consumption facility. At this meeting, we have added more opportunities for virtual participation, as well as other steps to reduce our carbon footprint. We are also partnering with our sister societies to stand up for scientific integrity in decision-making. The event that we are about to witness now is yet another contribution. I'm pleased to say that we have representatives of the We Are Still In and the C40's Cities Movements here today to discuss the importance of community efforts to fulfill our obligations to stabilizing the Earth's climate. But before moving on to the panel discussion, we have a very special treat. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our special guest, Baba Brinkman, a Canadian rap artist, writer, actor, and science advocate. He's rapped about evolution and climate change, worked together on a song with Bill Nye, the science guy, and has performed for world leaders at COP21. Baba's lyrics are unique in that he seeks out peer review, in some cases from AGU members, to ensure accuracy. Baba joins us as part of the efforts of AGU's Art and Science Engagement Group, which is another great and unique way to promote science communication. Please join me in welcoming Baba to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So uh, this song that I'm going to perform this morning is uh, from a project called The Rap Guide to Climate Chaos, which began when a climate scientist reached out to me and asked if I could summarize the complexities from the physical science to the politics to the economics uh, in hip-hop lyrical form. So that's what you're going to be getting now. This song is called Make It Hot. And henceforth, all plenaries must begin this way. Scientists are telling us that we're standing on a precipice, 
and we have to convert the global economy and make it emissionless. And those emissions are caused by every single one of our jobs, every one of us contributing carbon emissions to the smog. For instance, if I write a rhyme trying to describe climate change and it's hot so it catches on, someone's gonna fly me someplace to perform it. And the appeal of that is enormous. It's not an option for me to turn down work for global warming, cause I make it hot. Yeah, people say my rhymes are dope. I twist words until they're unrecognizable. I make it hot. I make it easy for sheezy. So hot, even climate change skeptics will believe me. I make it hot, like the temperature it needs to be before the Tea Party will believe the IPCC. I make it hot. I liquefy the Greenland ice sheets. Seven meters of sea level rise. That'll do nicely. And yeah, humans are adaptable, and we can toughen up, but that response ignores people who feel like it's already tough enough. Make a list of countries that nobody visits as a tourist. They have low carbon emissions. The richest inflicted this on the poorest. We did it by heating our houses and feeding our spouses and flying and driving places and having no patience for power outages. The Pope calls it anthropocentric. He calls it obnoxious, but I got work to do, and work takes energy to accomplish, and I make it hot. Yeah, I turn up the heat on a crowd. You make it hot too though, so don't try to be weaseling out. I make it hot. Like the African sun, like the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, I make it hot. Mm, feel that bass when it vibrates, hot like the permafrost, releasing methyl hydrates. I make it hot, like a planet with low albedo, like me rocking a trench coat on a beach instead of a speedo. Hot with no apologies, but still I'm feeling a lot of grief for the impact my lifestyle has on the planet's ecology. My carbon footprint is bigger than cryptozoologies. I'm talking Loch Ness monstrous, so I'm not at peace because the aggregate effect of every decision I'm making is tragic, but I can't just quit. They say that I'm carbon emission addict, but that's just glib. You want me to live in poverty abject, and if I did, what happens to greenhouse gases on average? If I quit and you don't, it's still hell in a handbasket. A traffic jam with no plan of action. Fantastic. This is a classic arms race that we're trapped in. It's ominous, self-interested party stuck in a tragedy of the con the problem is caused by our collective emissions of carbon But the person who emits is not the person emissions are harming So that's the failure of the market Like everyone is incentivized to pollute as much as they can get away with and catch a free ride So it's no surprise to see our emissions on the rise When the cost of burning fossil fuel is externalized It's effectively subsidized, it's paid for By the victims of the eventual climate impacts that are caused by our emissions And Bill McKibben and The Guardian have been targeted investments like dirty energy is the new tobacco so keep your distance from anybody making a profit off of fossil fuels cool I'm down with the boycott I'm just boycotting myself too cuz I make it hot yeah I cause a heat wave how about nine degrees hotter than the hottest ones these days I make it hot like climate refugees picture a hot hundred million displaced Bangladeshis I make it hot I spit flames rap metaphors a five alarm Blaze killing the last redwood forest, I make it hot. What if I make it six degrees? That'll cause the extinction of 40% of species. Hot. So what are we left with? A speeding train with no brakes? Some kind of a death wish? A scientific consensus that we're standing on a precipice and a population with no idea of to reduce their emissions. Some people do offset their footprint voluntarily with the milk of human altruism, hope, faith, and charity, but that's not gonna cut it. It's not counterproductive, but we have a global carbon budget and it's globally busted, and there are hundreds of gigatons that we would have to offset. You might as well donate your piggy bank to the national debt. I ain't got no spare change to donate to carbon offsetting. I don't even wanna calculate my footprint. I find it too upsetting. It's like the medieval Catholic Church back when it was indulgent selling if you get a Big Mac and a Diet Coke your belly's still swelling but here's what I'm willing I'm willing to pay a tax or a fee that's calculated against my carbon impacts and globally harmonized to switch incentives around and make sure most of that carbon stays safely under the ground but I'm not gonna pay it 
not unless you all pay it too. That way I can be sure that you'll do what you say you'll do. How about everyone has to pay it? No free riders allowed. No international pack with the US or China left out. You could invest it in green R&D or you could dividend it back to me. But either way, I won't be happy until the day they're carbon taxing me. Cause then I can make it high without ever feeling a chill. I'm just sick of this guilt trip. Killing my high when I'm feeling a thrill. So I make it high. I get your emotions aroused. If we can't make those hot, we're not gonna keep the oceans down. So let's make it hot. People, let's turn up the heat. I'm polluters trying to catch a ride on all the rest of us for free. I make it hot on the mic and in my social life. When I agitate for my friends to agitate at the ballot box for a carbon price. And that's how you make it hot. Thank you. I will also be performing a freestyle set at Mardi Gras World tonight. If you're coming to that party, you can give me any topic you want, and I'll flip it off the dome about it. And I've got a, a show tomorrow at 3 p.m. at the main hall, Great Hall. Uh, come check it out if you can. Thank you very much, Eric. Wow. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Baba. Like I said yesterday, uh, this is not your grandfather's AGU. <laughs> um, Baba will be writing notes during this session and will wrap a summary of the conclusion, so be sure to stay tuned. We've got more to look forward to. Now I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Dr. Don Bosch. I'm honored to work uh, to know Don through our work together at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, where Don stepped down just this year as our university president. Don was instrumental in getting all 12 university presidents and the chancellor of the University System of Maryland to sign on to the We Are Still In pledge. Today is sort of a homecoming for Don, as he is a native of New Orleans, a graduate of Tulane, and was the first executive director of the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium before moving to Maryland in 1990. With a PhD in oceanography from the College of William and Mary, Don is one of the nation's most recognized and experienced experts in the application of science to policies for the protection, sustainable use, and restoration of coastal ecosystems, and for adaptation to global climate change, including facilitating research and science-based policy for the Chesapeake Bay and his service on the National Commission of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Please welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Don Bosch, and I would also ask our panelists to come to the stage at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you well, how you doing? You know, you, they say you never want to follow an animal act or a rap uh, presentation. This is a hard act to follow. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thank you, Eric. Um, as a longtime member of AGU, I am proud of the stances and actions that the American Geophysical Union has taken over the past few years in defending science and affirming the scientific consensus on climate change. From its petition, uh, from its position statement on the urgency of addressing climate, to sponsoring the March on Science, to President Davidson's forceful response to APA Administrator Pruitt on the human cause of climate change, to hosting this session on why we are still in, the AGU is serving its members well. So thank you all. And and Eric, let me tell you how proud uh, your colleagues in, in University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science are in your service of president at such a critical juncture in our world and in our profession. It's unusual for a scientific society to play such an active and outspoken role, but it's an unusual time. And it's particularly important that the American Geophysical Union stand up and help this nation uh, remove its, move itself from its singular position of, re, of rejection that we've formally taken. So thank you, AGU. What is the We Are Still In Declaration? Well, Eric gave you a little uh, a bit about its background. Uh, and he said when President Trump 
announced the intent on June the 1st to uh, withdraw the United States' commitment to the Paris Agreement, leaders of companies, of businesses, of states, of, of cities, of counties and universities basically said, not so fast, buddy. We are still in. And what that means is that we're committed to fostering the understanding and of, our, of our constituents and the understanding of climate change, but we're also committed to do our part in lowering our emissions. So we're, that means we're going to, at a minimum, reduce our emissions consistent with what the, pre the, the previous commitment of the United States was. This is not a small undertaking. There are now 2,500 2, corporate, governmental, university leaders who have made this declaration, representing more than 130 million Americans with an econom economy of $6.2 trillion. So we can make a difference while our country figures it out. Signatories have included over 1,770 businesses and investors from Apple to the Sisters of Charity, literally, a wide range, about 250 cities and counties, including our host city of New Orleans and Carmel, Indiana, where led by Mayor Brainerd, who we'll, you will hear from shortly. Nine states, California, Connecticut, Hawaii, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Rhode Island, Virginia, and Washington, the governors of those states say, we are still in. Approximately 340 colleges and university, ranging from the University of California to the Anabap Anabaptist Men uh, Mennonite Biblical Seminary, and including here in New Orleans, Loyola University, uh, their, their leaders have said we are still in. And as Eric said, proudly, our 12 institutions and our university system have made that pledge as well. Uh, with the AGU meeting um, here held in New Orleans, my hometown, on this day that uh, we have an election in Alabama, it's important that we help this region, the south southeastern part of our state, be part of this movement and understand that we have, a, we have a need and a responsibility to act on climate. Unfortunately, the issue has been politicized. So on, as we look around the universities that have agreed to the We, we Are Still In Declaration, we find only three pri public and private universities that are engaged in research in the southeast or Texas that have yet signed on. Duke, University of Miami, and University of South Carolina. Presidents of many more colleges and universities have now made, uh, committed to be part of the made second nature climate commitments to become carbon neutral by the middle of this century. Among the private and public universities, there are many private and public universities, thank, thankfully, in the Southeast who have made that. So those of you who work in this area, work in your institutions, help your leaders uh, become successful in honoring their commitments uh, to lower our emissions in our colleges and universities, and to also adapt understanding of climate change, adopt understanding of climate change and sustainability in our curricular. So now I want to um, introduce our distinguished panel who represent three very disparate cities um, in, in the United States, in North America, I should say. Uh, the first, first you'll hear from, um, uh, you'll hear from Jeff, um, uh, Jim Brainerd, who is the mayor of Carmel, Indiana. That's not Carmel, California. He doesn't look like Clint Eastwood, does he? Uh, he's been the mayor 22 years, so you were mayor when Clint was the mayor of Carmel. Uh, and Jim is, uh, is exceptional because his county, his, his, his city, and his own political affiliation is, is conservative, fiscally conservative Republican, and he's going to tell you what they've gone through with their public and, and local government. We will then hear from uh, uh, Tanya Mula Garcia, who is the secretary of the of environment for the city of Mexico City, a city that has nine million residents and within the city limits in a region that has an additional 23 million, so larger than most states in this country. And then finally, uh, we'll, fi we'll, fi we'll finish up with um, uh, Jeff Aber. Now, you've got to have to, had to correct people with the pronunciations in this. Aber is a uh, silent H and an accent on the E. It's a good local Louisiana name 
And Jeff, as you might expect, is a native of this fair city. Uh, went to a, a rival high school, that, the, one, the one that I went to, so, but we won't, we won't debate that. So let me ask uh, first uh, Jim Brainerd to come up. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here in New Orleans. First going to tell you a bit about my city. It was a thousand people at the end of World War II. Today it's about a hundred thousand people. It's typical of cities that grew in the last half of the 20th century from almost nothing to what we often refer to as suburban sprawl. As a result, we put out a lot of carbon. Uh, one couldn't walk from one place to another or any place one needed to go, really. We uh, relied on automobiles. It's also a city that uh, I think since the Republican Party was formed in the 1860s has never elected a Democrat, 80% uh, Republican. Yet our city council just a few weeks ago passed a resolution uh, pledging to reduce our carbon uh, with a goal of net zero by 2040. Sometimes people say, why does this happen? How could that happen? And I point out I've yet to meet a Republican or a Democrat or an independent that wants their children and their family to drink dirty water or breathe dirty air. It doesn't make any sense not to leave the earth in a better condition than we found it. And I think most people, regardless of the small percentage of uh, Republicans that are denying the science, and it is about uh, a third of the party, according to surveys, that deny the science. Uh, the, the key is, though, that, that uh, those of us uh, not in that group need to speak out, need to speak out loudly, uh, remember the history of the Republican Party all the way from Teddy Roosevelt onward that uh, promoted environmental uh, improvement and move ahead. And it's important, I think, also to remember that um, the U.S. is just not the federal government. Its state government is 1,250 some local governments over 30,000 in population all making improvements in their cities to make it uh, better for the environment. I'm gonna show just a few slides. There's our city hall in Carmel. What we've done that's probably different from most suburban communities is we didn't have a downtown. Everything was strip centers. Uh, and so the city went out and bought 100 acres, master planned a downtown, which was mixed use development, walkable, pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly, and the mixed use is key because that means somebody can live and work and go to stores without having to get into a car. And there you see some pictures of our new downtown. All that's built, we, we still had to accommodate cars of course, but they're underground in that picture, in underground garages. Uh, we didn't design for them, uh, we started to design again for people, not automobiles. There's our village center again, three to five story mixed use development, the way that cities had been built for centuries before the car came along. And by before the car came, cities had to be sustainable. They had to be walkable and pedestrian friendly. There was no option. There's more pictures. Uh, one of the things we've done in our city is to make sure people can get from any corner of that 50 square miles to the center by bicycle. Over 200 miles of bicycle and pedestrian trails. This is not Carmel. This is though the way much of suburban America that well over 75% of our citizens live in places that have development like that. Um, can you imagine going for a romantic walk past that parking lot? You wouldn't even want to walk there. There's our option. Again, a big box store, a dick sporting goods, but we put a park in front of it, put all the cars behind, made it walkable ran bike trails to that area. This again is not Carmel, but this shows 
the emphasis our designers and builders and architects have on the automobile. What's prominent in that picture up in the top right? The car. It has sidewalks, but where would you walk? In fact, if you had more than one beer, would you even get the right house? This is my favorite slide and the last one I'll close with. Well, this is a smart group. Usually I have to explain it. To give you a couple of examples very quickly of things we've done, uh, we looked at everything city government does. Say, how can we be more efficient? How can we do it better? One thing we did, which is unique, we built more roundabouts than any city in the country. Not only because we reduce injury accidents by 80% and they move 70% more traffic. Uh, for those of you from Europe, we, we, we learned from you in this. But we're also saving an average of 25,000 gallons of gasoline per roundabout a year. That's with 115 roundabouts. So what we've tried to do as a city is to look at every aspect of city government, figure out how we can be more efficient, how we can reduce carbon output, how we can save energy. And let me tell you, I'm a member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, head up a committee there on the environment. Every city in the United States is doing the same thing, regardless of whether it's Republican or Democratic uh, leadership. And just from the efforts at local, 85% of our population in the United States lives in an, urban, in an urbanized area, was defined as an urbanized area. They're looking at the data and they're concluding that they have to make changes. And regardless of what the federal government, local government's going to continue, they're still committed to the goals that were expressed in the Paris Accord. And we'll meet those goals because of what's happening on the local level. Thank you. Tanya, please. So good afternoon. Hello? Love it's on now. Okay. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. So I would like, I don't know if we could have my presentation. Okay, great. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit of the urban world context and then the role of cities to meet the Paris Agreement. And of course, what Mexico is doing as a subnational government to contribute to the Paris Agreement. So first of all, as we all know, cities have been growing and will continue to grow over the next decades. Uh, today, over 50% of the population lives in cities, and we see how this trend will continue. Something that I think is very interesting is the gap emissions report that was just uh, released a couple of days ago, where we can clearly see in this graph Today, the nationally determined contributions only comply with one third of the emissions reductions that are needed to stay below the two degree goal. But if we add the city and private sector actions, such as the Compact of Mayors from 2015, the Climate Group of 2016, we mean business on behalf of the private sector and the carbon disclosure product, C Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, from 2016, we can see that we really can reduce the gap that we have to, uh, to comply with by 2030 from 17 gigatons to 11, between 11 and 13.5 gigatons. So we really think that it's important to have this unity from the local actions and the non-state actors to comply with the Paris Agreement. Uh, Mexico City is part of the world network of C40 cities, which is also uh, in coordination with the declaration of we are still in. And as you can see, C40 uh, integrates 91 cities worldwide, mega cities. Uh, one out of every 12 people worldwide live in a C40 city. And Mexico City is a representative for the Latin American region. And today, uh, together with other eight cities, we are working on our pilot uh, climate action program to comply with the Paris Agreement. And we will have to have this new climate action program ready in the first quarter of 2018. So this is a very concrete action of how we will comply with the Paris Agreement through the subnational governments. And here you can see the other cities that are also participating 
in, this, uh, in the pilot project. So a little bit of, of Mexico City, as it was mentioned at the beginning. We're 9 million inhabitants within the city, 22 million in the metropolitan area. We have over 5 million vehicles. That represents 22 million trips every day. So imagine the, the use of fossil fuels that we have there. And obviously, we emit, uh, we're, we're high emitters. We, we emit 20 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So what are we doing as a city, uh, Mexico City, to be able to really reduce our emissions? Uh, we have two goals in our climate action program. Our first goal is to mit mitigate 10 million tons of CO2 equivalent by 2020. And our second goal is our, an adaptation goal. How can we reduce the vulnerability of 5.6 million inhabitants. And something that has been very important here is that we've worked closely with 100 resilient cities. Last year, we presented our resilience strategy, the only one in the country. And this year, we formalized, the Mayor Mancera formalized our resilience office. So that will be very important. Um, our climate action program has 130 actions. And here you can see the, the seven strategic accesses we have. But I think that one of the most important uh, perspectives that our Climate Action Program has is our gender responsive perspective. Because we know that women are more vulnerable to climate change. So we are implementing actions to reduce this gender gap. And just to give you a quick example, you can see here uh, women that still cook with wood stoves in Mexico City. 60% of our territory is conservation land. Only 40% is urban. So we're, we're investing in biodigesters to eliminate the, the wood stoves for cooking because we know this is hazardous for the health of the women, but it also impacts our area emissions. Some of the other actions, or our main climate actions within the city is our BRT lines, our bus rapid transport system. We have a very strict uh, emissions review on behalf of the vehicles, which is also very important. And in, this, in the last five years, we have invested very strongly in bicycle infrastructure because 50% of all the trips in Mexico City are less than eight kilometers. And this is where we know that the bicycles can be very effective. And obviously changing and, and taking, um, transitioning from normal taxis as many other cities to electric and hybrid taxis of a way of public transport. We also have an online monitoring system which really helps us see if one of the ministries or goals are falling behind that we can see if, if they're lacking support or budget to move forward. And obviously, we know that financing is a huge challenge for subnational governments to accomplish our climate action programs. So what we've done is, since we know that we can't access the international funds if it's not through the national government, we have implemented our own environmental climate uh, change fund our green bond and sustainable bond. So with our climate change fund, we're implementing, for example, solar panels in the public hospitals of Mexico City to reduce the use of diesel. And these were just taken a couple of days ago. So this is a project that will, that will have uh, concluded by December and the second phase will be in 2018. Uh, Mexico City issued the first green bond in Latin America for 53 million US dollars, so we can guarantee the financing of our climate action uh, program. And the Green Bonds Initiative recognized this since it's a very innovative form of financing for the cities, and there's a huge potential, I believe, for, for financing through green bonds. And uh, just last week, Mayor Mancera received uh, an award from C40 because of Mexico City's climate action program due to the innovation on gender perspective, our monitoring system, and financing scheme. 
So I'm really convinced that the actions taken at the subnational level have an important impact not only in the city and at the regional level, but obviously also at the national level. So it's very important for this unity to be expressed between the local actions and the different declarations from We Are Still In, C40, the American Pledge, and, and it's great um, to, to be here. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Tanya. I, I neglected, uh, neglected to say when I introduced Jeff that he uh, played a critical role in the recovery of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and became the, the officer, the, the director of resilience in the city. And then the Mayor, Mayor Landrieu said, keep that job, but I want you to do another job. So he's also the deputy mayor uh, for the city of New Orleans under Mayor Landrieu. Thank you. Um, Thank you, everyone, uh, and welcome to New Orleans on behalf of Mayor Landrieu, who unfortunately could not join us today. Um, hopefully, I'm a, a bit of a substitute for him, but I know I, I can't do it as, as well as he can. So thanks for being in New Orleans, um, and I think this is a really important conversation to have uh, here in New Orleans, um, specifically because there's arguably no greater uh, threat uh, to this city's existence than climate change, uh, and that's actually a word that we can say in the city of New Orleans. Um, uh, we, we are proud to, to be able to say it. So welcome to everyone. Um, on behalf of the mayor, who also is the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, and has uh, taken this topic up uh, across the country with the other mayors of the country, uh, Don, welcome home. Um, to the mayor, welcome to New Orleans. Uh, and to Secretary Mula Garcia, thank you for coming to New Orleans. Um, as you have seen in her slides, Mexico City has been such uh, a leader in this work and has been a partner actually with the city of New Orleans in uh, developing our climate action strategy uh, and our resilience strategy. So it's very nice for you to be here as you've hosted us uh, in Mexico City. So while, why are we still in here in New Orleans? For New Orleans, climate change is a matter of life and death. New Orleans is already experiencing the dangers of a changing climate, rising seas, increasingly stronger storms, extreme heat, and prolonged drought. The National Academy of Sciences stated New Orleans will experience one of the highest increases in sea level rise uh, among all coastal cities, as much as 14 and a half inches by 2040 and six and a half feet by 2100. Meanwhile, urban land subsidence is causing neighborhoods across New Orleans to slowly sink. Louisiana's wetlands are the fastest disappearing delta on the planet. Every year, more than 15,000 acres of coast are lost to the Gulf of Mexico. Extreme heat is another projected risk of climate change. By 2050, Louisiana will likely experience temperatures above 95 degrees Fahrenheit on 80 or more days per year. Today, believe it or not, we average fewer than 10. We realize that the survival of our city depends on effectively managing our relationship with water and our climate. Because we are experiencing climate change threats today, we are taking action with our fellow cities. In August 2015, New Orleans released the world's first comprehensive resilience strategy, outlining our values and vision for an adaptable, equitable, and dynamic future city. We're working to advance the, goal, the global practice of resilience and ensuring that cities around the world can learn from what we learned in our dark days. We participated in the UN's COP21 climate negotiations in Paris and committed to joining the more than 7,000 cities around the world in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Cities like ours are taking the lead and we are acting now. This past July, we released Climate Action for a Resilient New Orleans because we believe it is not enough to just plan for how we will adapt to climate change. We must end our contribution to it. We are taking action to modernize our energy use with a goal of 100% low carbon power by 2030. We are taking action to improve our transportation choices with a goal of 50% non-automobile trips by 2030. We are taking action to reduce our waste with a goal of diverting 50% of it from landfills. And to accomplish this, we are also taking action to create a culture of awareness and action among our residents, businesses, and visitors. And just last week, our mayor joined over 50 North American mayors in signing the Cl Chicago Climate Charter, uh, including Mayor Mancera of Mexico City. And while we mitigate, we are also adapting our city and our lives to the risks ahead. We are committed to a multiple lines of defense strategy when it comes to preparing for future threats. The U.S. government has invested more than $14.5 billion in our hurricane risk reduction system, the levees and flood walls that surround the New Orleans region. 
We are elevating homes and businesses. We are investing in drainage upgrades and green infrastructure to reduce our risk from intense storms. We are supporting the efforts of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority here in Louisiana in implementing the $50 billion Coastal Master Plan. Understanding the effects of extreme weather events, just last month, the voters of this city approved a measure to reserve funds to respond to these events. We are ensuring against the losses that we know we cannot avoid, and we are working to instill a culture of preparedness and resilience in our daily lives. Comprehensive urban water management is central to our climate resilience. With inspiration from cities around the world and the vision of the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan, we are reimagining how we live with water in the lower Mississippi Delta. Hurricanes are not our only major rain events. Even regularly occurring rainstorms can cause major flooding problems in New Orleans neighborhoods. To help manage these storms, today in New Orleans, a combined $5.3 billion in water, sewer, drainage, and roadway improvements are underway as we speak. We are launching an unprecedented green infrastructure program to manage our rainfall and to alleviate pressure on our overburdened gray infrastructure drainage system of pipes and pumps, which frankly contribute to our greenhouse gas emissions as well. As we approach our city's 300th history, 300th birthday in 2018, we find ourselves looking to our history to remind ourselves how we have lived with water in the past, but also to the future to embrace our changing environment and the partnerships and innovative approaches to coastal and urban water management that will help us enjoy another 300 years in our Delta home. Thank you. So, so thank you all. Uh, I am going to ask uh, the panel uh, a few questions to get the discussion going, but hopefully we'll have some time for audience questions. So think about questions, and there are microphones around. You can, you can queue up if you like. But let me start with uh, Mayor Brainerd. You know, uh, uh, you're uh, uh, really a role model uh, for communities like yours around the country. And, uh, and many of our members, our scientists who are members of AGU, actually live in towns your size, small towns, some of them conservatively run, conservative people. And they would like to play a role in this. How, how would you, if you, have a, you were an AGU member living in a, in a small town in a, or a city in the Midwest or the South, how would you approach your local government leaders to basically convince them it's time to begin to take action? Because as you said, it makes sense and it saves, saves money, it's efficient. I think it's important to recognize there's sometimes many ways to get to the same end result. And I have these discussions with people who question or are skeptical about the science, some who outright deny it from time to time. One of the things I do, particularly with other Republican office holders, younger ones perhaps, I point out the history of the Republican Party when it comes mm -hmm. to, to environmental action. Starting with Teddy Roosevelt, Republican, over 100 years ago, set aside most of our national parks. Uh, Eisenhower, a Republican in the 1950s, who set aside the Arctic Reserve. Nixon, who uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, between he and President Ford, signed almost all of our federal environmental reg regulations into effect. Migratory Bird Act, the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Drinking Act. The EPA itself was established during that return. Even Ronald Reagan went uh, to, uh, I think at Margaret Thatcher's urging went to, uh, with her science background, went to uh, Montreal to deal with the ozone hole protocols. Uh, so there's this history of, of um, nonpartisanship when it comes to uh, environmental action. And then sometimes, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who's a denier, and he was complaining about the fact that I spent about a million dollars to change out all of our street lights to LED lights. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I couldn't convince him. Finally, I said, well, we're getting a 21% annualized return on investment through electricity savings. Suddenly he became very happy. I was saving him tax money. <laughs> and he went off, oh, I don't care. He didn't care whatsoever about the environment, but the fact, so there's different ways. My point is there's different ways to talk to, to, to people depending on their perspective. There's uh, jobs all the green jobs we're missing out on as a country, uh, all the science that could be applied in, in making new products the world wants, 
savings. Usually when there's an environment, when we save energy, we save money. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things. And so you have to just, I think, get involved, make your point to the people. But there's, remember, there's different ways besides simply the science to get people to do what you'd like them to do. Yeah, great. Tanya, when, when the U.S., when it was, the nose came out that President Trump was going to draw the United States from the Paris Agreement, and you're sitting in Mexico City, how, how does this affect your job and your efforts in Mexico City? Does it re increase the resolve of constituents, or does it say, you know, don't worry, the U.S. isn't doing it, we won't? How, how do you deal with that, the well, consequences of U.S. policy? I think on the contrary, it really um, increases our commitment to comply with the Paris Agreement, especially because we know that Mexico at the national level is one of the more vulnerable countries is, right. regarding climate change. Mm -hmm. So obviously what we do at the local level is very important to contribute to the national goals. And something that I, we were just commenting uh, before the panel is it's surprising how really in Mexico I would say that the 32 governors and the national government, uh, Mexico City, were really focused and on track for climate change, you know, despite all the other political disagreements we can have, <laughs> because the, the, the government of Mexico City is, is different, is a different party from the national government. I really think climate change is something that brings us together mm -hmm. and really reinforces that commitment. Right. Great. Jeff, you, you're here in New Orleans, as you described almost an existential threat of climate change. And so the mayor is taking action. But if you look, you know, what's happening in Baton Rouge with the state government or the congressional delegation, mm -hmm. they're not they're in the same place necessarily with you. Mm -hmm. And yet it's their, their city. So how, how, do you, how do you, what are you doing? Like how can we convince the leaders at the state and, and congressional level? to take action uh, like yeah. you're talking about? Well, I think there's, a, there's a, a couple things that probably makes this state a little bit unique um, in, in the way we talk about uh, climate change. And, and one of them is that um, uh, although uh, we, the legislature is a conservative uh, Republican legislature uh, right now, um, the state legislature approves the Coastal Master Plan every year, which, which is based on the science uh, that groups like this organization contributes to mm -hmm. the science of that master plan. And so it's a recognition uh, that these things are happening and the state has to invest in projects um, that we would call in the city of New Orleans um, uh, either mitigation or adaptation projects for climate change. So we're in a bit of a unique place where we are actually addressing the issues and talking about them and using the science albeit on the political level, it's not discussed in the way that, yeah. that you would other places. So as you, as you said, the master plan, the state have, have recognized that they're, they're, they've taken scenarios of different rates of sea level rise right. and trying to plan for right. those, those outcomes. But they haven't necessarily embraced the concept that those scenarios depend on what we do Absolutely. with respect to emissions. Yes. So, so that, that's the difficult that, sell. That, that, is the, that is the difficult sell, and that is where the sort of chasm is between us. I, I would say the, uh, our focus has been, um, uh, and the mayor uh, addressed this a, a second ago, our focus, particularly through the U.S. Conference of Mayors, has been how cities can come together regardless of, of uh, political background to really advance uh, our thinking and take action um, on these issues because we believe as cities that we can contribute greatly at the local level right. to trying to solve this problem even if at the state uh, and national level it isn't happening the way that we'd like to see it. And I would say that's in concert not just with um, cities uh, in the U.S., but through organizations like C40, which we're also a member of with cities all over the world, really right. Right. cities taking action. Uh, to combat the issues that we see ahead. So in a similar way, Mayor Brainerd, what, can you tell us about the discussions you have with your Congress lady and, and your, your senators who, uh, about this, what you're doing and how they should help? Well, we certainly make them aware of what we're doing. I, I think that our Congress uh, woman has uh, argued in the caucus that we should be more active mm -hmm. um, on, the, mm -hmm. on climate. Uh, and I think it's an issue in the elections. You know, that's ultimately the yep. right. way to make change in this country is, right. is to elect people that that are going to do what we'd like them to do. Yep. 
Secretary, Secretary Mueller, you, you talked about how vulnerable Mexico is to climate change, and you're trying to get prepare the population and your infrastructure and so on to deal with it. So we have a lot of experts in this room. What, what are the most critical information needs, the science that you, you need to help you prepare for that future that, that you're lacking now? So I, some, I think that's something that is very important for decision makers and, and public policy and from my experience, for example, we've talked a lot about climate change, but we know that it's very interrelated with air quality and air quality has to do with public health. Yep. So it would, it, what we're trying to work on is how we can predict and the difference between climate variability mm -hmm. that impacts our air quality, such as ozone, um, but also how we can model uh, the impacts of climate change towards 2030, 2050, so that we can foresee how we have to adapt or change our public policies to really be better prepared in the future, to be more resilient, not only at the government level, but also for, for civil society to be prepared and how do you communicate those risks. So today we're working with the, um, the Supercomputing Center of Barcelona, mm -hmm. trying to see how we can model those, uh, ver that variability in climate that will right. affect uh, right. air and so quality. So you need this on the regional scale, the that, regional that's specific scale, exactly. to the place. Even more importantly, I think, you know, every, there, there's an old saying some politician came up with, everybody sees their city from their back porch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so true. And so it's important not only to do it, I think, on a regional basis, but block by block basis. Yep. How, how, is, how is climate change going to impact your neighborhood and your life? Then we can motivate people to, to, to get interested. Yep. Great. So let's turn to the audience. Let's start over here first. Is, can you turn the mics on? Is this work? Okay, now yeah, it's working. Fine. Hi. Um, uh, so, actually, my question can be for anybody, but it's somewhat directed at Mayor Brainerd. So, I'm from Indiana originally. Um, I grew up um, in a region that looked more like the parking lot kind of way of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Carmel looks like a beautiful city, and I uh, really, you know, it's some place that I would like to live. Um, but my sister lives in Carmel, and she lives in one of the older neighborhoods. And from her perspective, uh, the city has changed in a way she doesn't like. And in fact, there, there are uh, reports that the buildup of the condos is actually causing flooding and rundown to the lower elevation levels. And so th this, is, this is a question, like, are, are these reports founded? And if so, do the people who feel like they didn't want their community to change, they didn't want to see it grow in this way, and are feeling left behind by the initiatives that you're putting in. How, like, how do you address their concerns mm -hmm. in a way that still promotes sustainability and addresses issues with climate change? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, and we have had so much change in our city, and we have done it so differently than many suburban areas. There are those, particularly those who families that may have been there for a long time, they do object to the change. It's not a majority. Uh, and, and that's what I point out is, is that, uh, you know, it is a government majority rule and the vast number of people do agree with our mixed use developments and our walkability and, and making it, designing a city. And this is where we can make tremendous strides in this country by designing cities so they're inherently more sustainable. You don't, the average American drives, the average American, including all those people in New York and Chicago and big cities that don't drive, the average American still drives two hours a day, 100 miles. We have to design our cities so that's not necessary. And that means there's change and there's disruption. And yes, we'll have some stormwater problems from time to time when you do those sort of things. But it's important we might not back down from doing it. Uh, it's the right thing to do for our cities. Let's, let's, uh, let's take, uh, we, don't, we have a little time, so if we don't mind. You can follow up discussing this with, with Mayor, I'm sure. Can we take a so, next uh, question? 
I live in California, in San Diego. I am a work at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, I'd like to applaud this panel for the steps that they're taking. I think it's wonderful to see this local, these local efforts. Um, I've got two questions, and they're really related. Um, one is, uh, do you think you know enough to save the city of New Orleans or any other city in a similar vulnerable situation? And secondly, is the local effort going to be enough, or is it really going to depend on timely intervention at the federal level, for example, in, within any country? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll say uh, we always want to know more um, because, as most of you in the room know, models change. Um, I, I was on a flight to Italy to present at a conference, and overnight, while I was on the flight, a model changed in the sea level rise projection for the city of New Orleans. And so I had to change my presentation after I got off the flight uh, because it had changed overnight. So it, this is a constantly changing, um, and, and our dependence on you um, to give us the best information available is, is really important to us. So I would, I would answer that question and say, no, we don't have enough. We always want more. Uh, and we've had really good relationships uh, all over the world in, in providing us really good data uh, and really good science behind what it is we need to do. The second question is an outright no. We cannot do it alone. We can do what we can, uh, but I think uh, city of Miami, city of Norfolk, Virginia, New Orleans, just name a city in this country. Uh, it's a little bit different in other countries because of their investment in infrastructure, but our country's lack of investment in infrastructure is a huge problem in our ability to uh, focus on what needs to happen uh, for climate change and to prepare our coastal cities for these issues, and not just our coastal cities, but our cities that will suffer from drought, wildfires in California, all these things. Uh, so I, I would say that we, we can do what we can, uh, but without, particularly in the United States, in our context, without national funding uh, for infrastructure, whether it be blue, green infrastructure, nat nature-based solutions, and those things, it, 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 it frankly is virtually impossible because the level of financial commitment that you need to transform uh, the cities of this country. Yes, there's a question on the all right. Wendell Walters, Brown University. Uh, my question is more directed to uh, Mayor Brannard. Um, having lived close to Carmel, you know, it's always been a great place to visit, but it is one of the most expensive places in Indiana. So how can we sort of adopt this model for, um, to take into account different uh, social and economic backgrounds? I <clears throat> I would caution you know, that expense, you know, look at prices in Providence versus uh, Indiana, if you would for a minute, it's a very reasonable place to live. I, I would take issue with that, maybe compared to one town over or something, it might be slightly more. But, yeah, true, but your question really is deeper than that. I think the question is, how do cities develop in a way that are equitable for everyone, including the poor? And that relies a lot on city design, too. When people are social, social isolation is a huge problem. Uh, when people don't have uh, good public transit or personal transportation. Mm -hmm. So designing our cities in a way where people can interact on a generational, intergenerational interaction can take place, where people can walk or use a bicycle to get to a decent job. Uh, all these things are inherent in the city design and are also things, if we design our cities in that way, are gonna be more sustainable um, from an environmental standpoint. The two really go hand in hand. Um, so those, those are my thoughts. Yeah, well, great. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and I want to first uh, thank um, uh, Senora Mueller, uh, Mayor Brainerd, and Mr. Ebert. Uh, please give them a hand. And we will, we will take our exit stage left or right, whichever the, way, uh, the direction is, <laughs> and we'll bring Baba back. Uh, this isn't exactly a freestyle because I wrote it on my phone, but I did write it on my phone over the past hour. Uh, so this is uh, inevitably a kind of performance entitled a wrap up. <laughs> I got a feeling that America's still in. 
Every part of it except for the federal government, which is currently under the control of that unfortunate one-third set of Republicans who reject the science either by ignoring it or by actively shoveling elephant dung on it. But if the federal government, whether Dem or Republican, is as clumsy as an elephant rumbling, then cities are the gazelles that we obviously need to be running with. Take it from me, shorty. When I'm bringing the climate resilience lyrics, I'm hyphy like E-40. But if I'm looking for hope in the current political climate, I'm looking to C-40. Coastal cities are prone to flooding and falling to disrepair. If only they all had a deputy mayor like Jeff E. Bear. We need to resist despair, especially when the outcomes of a climate accord becomes life or death. Just ask Jeff, he's been there before. I would totally watch a show with him as the host called the E. Bear Report. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm glad he's a politician instead of an entertainer. But I can't say I feel the same way about Jim Brainerd. Climate change communication is complicated, but mix it with entertainment and it triggers less anger. Suddenly taking action seems like a no-brainer, like Jim's image of an escalator up to a gymnasium. Now, let's take the 20 miles a day of driving and change it, and pursue every viable bit of usable idea, several of which were today on display right here. If a city is emitting 20 million tons of carbon per year, we could just cut that in half, asked Tanya Muller garcia we can't solve it with conferences. It's not going to change by lectures. It changes with wood stoves being replaced in, by biodigesters. So the summary is, don't sit back and be chillin'. Don't try to print this all on a single set of horrible villains. Just find the problems, identify them, and begin dealing, and then spread the message. Yeah, America is still in. <laughs>